A few weeks back, I took part in Mech Jam 3, where I created not only my first tactics game, but also my first fully 3D game in Godot, LMX. And in this video, I'm going to break down how I managed to pull this off, including details on art creation, design considerations, project structure, and system design, since I figure the game dev world could use more info on how these systems-based games are made. Not saying that I've done everything right, because I definitely have not, but just sharing what did and did not work for me, and what my takeaways are for future projects, so that maybe it'll spark some ideas for you as well. So real quick, what is LMX? It is a turn-based tactical combat game where you control mechs that can control one of three elements, fire, water, and lightning. As you'd expect from a game involving the elements, there are also interactions between elements. Water puts out fire but makes lightning stronger, for instance, and fire burns enemies over several turns but can also be used to burn trees and therefore carve new paths through the levels. I want to go a lot further with this concept of elemental interactions, including letting mechs merge together to create new elements, such as fire plus water mech equals steam mech, but as is always the case with game jams, I had to cut scope pretty aggressively and just settle on the foundational concept of elemental mechs, which really are the main hook here anyways, and as I mentioned before, this was my first tactics game so I kind of had to stick to some pretty standard tactics stuff for the rest of the game. So there's a square grid, one team goes after the other, and acting before moving ends your turn early, and so on. If you've played any sort of tactics game before, like Fire Emblem, Into the Breach, and so on, then you're going to be comfortable with LMX. So with that out of the way, let's talk about how this game was actually made. I'm going to start out by talking about artwork, and I may do a more in-depth look at this process in a future video, but since I wanted to do the artwork myself, and I can't really draw isometric very well, I decided to go 3D but with some massive assist to make this feasible in the time available. So all assets in the game are made with Asset Forge, which is an offering by the one and only Kenny, where you can take pre-designed blocks and piece them together to make new and interesting designs. You're obviously limited to Kenny's unique style of low-poly artwork, but if you're okay with that, and I personally am, then this is an incredibly fast way to make 3D art. Furthermore, since I had to keep scope minimal, I decided to just make one mech model and recolor it for the different unit types. Simple and effective. After modeling comes rigging and animation, which at first I thought I might try to do myself since I know just enough Blender to be dangerous, but after spending an hour or so with mediocre results, I decided to just go with my planned alternative of using Mixamo. Mixamo isn't exactly a secret in the game dev world, but it's absolutely worth trying out if you have humanoid characters you want to rig and animate. You just take your model, drop a few points onto it so that the app knows where the different parts of the body are, and you end up with a fully rigged character ready to be animated either by yourself or by using the large library of animations that Mixamo offers. Oh, and uh, all of this is free by the way. The main downside to Mixamo, other than being stuck with their library of animations, is that it doesn't let you download multiple animations in one file, meaning even on a small project like mine with only one mech to animate, I had to download over 10 files and then merge them myself. There's a few different ways to do this, including websites, Blender tutorials, and so on, but I just did it all in Godot since you can copy and paste animations from one file to another. And speaking of Godot, as mentioned above, this was my first proper 3D game in Godot. I'm not completely new to the process as I have done some 3D prototypes in the past, but there was still a lot to figure out, and as many are aware, the default 3D environment in Godot is pretty mediocre, so I went with the guidance from this YouTube video by Tokusen Games to help create a vibrant, colorful game and then adjusted from there. I still had to do some odd color and material tweaks to get the models looking how I wanted to between Asset Forge and Godot, but I'm going to chalk that up more to my own inexperience with with lighting and materials and so on, and at least editing materials in Godot is easy enough. So now let's look at how I structured the code of the application, because there is a lot going on in even a basic tactics game like this, and while I think I got the general idea right, there's definitely room for improvement here. So let's start out with the mechs, which all share the same base entity and then apply their own customizations on top of it. Each mech consists of the model, animations, which are all stored in an animation player node, some particle effects, and a state machine, which usually just watches for an animation to finish and tells the parent entity we're done doing something, though the movement state also determines the route to the target destination and moves along that route at the desired speed, for instance. All of the mid-state triggers, such as when to play a sound effect or when to deal damage when an attack lands, are fired in the animation for that state, which had the really cool side effect of letting me put an animation speed setting in the game so that you can speed up the rate of play. This setting basically just increases movement speed and changes the playback speed property of the animation player node, and everything else just works. 
The list of actions that each mech can take is a simple resource that really just acts as a container of actions. And it probably could have even just been kept simpler as an array since I don't need persistence throughout the application. And while I did have some additional uses in mind originally for what this list could do, that ended up not happening. Actions themselves also extend the resource class and consist of a list of effects and some metadata about the action, such as its name in the UI, what method it should be using for selecting a target, such as a single cell versus a line of sight, and so on. Effects are what actually define what an action does. Each effect defines a single aspect of an action, such as a state change, a function call, or even just dealing damage to a target. With a collection of effects on an action, we can therefore have actions with unique abilities. A typical attack action, for instance, might consist of a planning effect to let us know that the user or AI needs to first select a target, followed by a change state effect to trigger the attack animation, which as mentioned previously will trigger the actual damage resolution once the animation is at the point where an attack would land on the target, but it does use a damage effect to know how much damage to deal. I will say that overall, while I liked this system pretty well, I did find using resources for every effect to be a pain since I have to duplicate each instance of the effect so that I could have effect A do a different amount of damage than effect B. So I don't know if I'd go with this method again. I think I prefer what I've done on Kaiju Clash where I define some basic data container classes in code using the reference class and then instantiate them at runtime to define what an attack does. It's not quite as pretty or convenient as editing things in the editor, but it does mean I don't have to remember to click make unique in the editor when I'm editing a resource. Food for thought on trade-offs at the very least. So now that we have our actions set up, how do they actually work in practice? Well, first we select our action to take, either from the UI for player-controlled mechs or as decided by the AI node on every mech, more on that later. Once an action is selected, it goes to an action resolver node, which handles actually parsing out the effects of an action and figuring out how to execute it. The repair action, for instance, plays the repair animation and heals the mech, which is pretty straightforward and simple to resolve. But most actions require an additional planning stage before execution. Where are you moving to? What target do you want to attack? Etc. If the mech is player controlled, we signal that we need the player to decide a target. If the mech is AI controlled, we already know our target since that was taken into account during the decision making process. Either way, once the target has been selected, we let the resolver know to continue resolving the action and go through all effects, changing states, calling functions, etc. until they've all been resolved. Once this is complete, we signal that the mech has completed its turn and that the game should go on to the next mech. With the systems and design of actions out of the way, we can now take a quick game design detour to talk about the attacks themselves and how everything is balanced to provide an interesting challenge to the player. Initially, each mech was going to have the move and repair actions along with two element specific attacks. After a few days of development though, it became clear that doing two unique attacks per mech would take too much time to implement and balance and that my time was better spent elsewhere. So every mech in the game shares the repeck, move, and punch actions and then has a unique ranged attack. The punch attack is strong, but requires the attacking mech to be adjacent to the target. The unique attacks are as follows. Enemy mechs have a pistol attack that is weak but has a long range. Fire mechs have a short range flamethrower attack that deals medium damage, but also deals burn damage to mechs over time and can be used to clear foliage. Water mechs have a weak medium range attack that boosts lightning damage. And lightning mechs have a long range medium strength attack that becomes extremely powerful when combined with water. With everything listed out like that, and keeping in mind that all mechs have identical stats, it becomes pretty clear how the attacks are balanced. Generally speaking, attacks get weaker the larger their ranges, with the exception of lightning attacks which always do at least a moderate amount of damage. The trade-off on lightning attacks though is that since they are most powerful when combined with water attacks, and since the water attack on its own is really weak, there's a strong opportunity cost to not using a lightning attack on a mech that is wet. I'm not going to claim that the attacks are perfectly balanced, or that no attack in the game couldn't do more or less damage and be better. But the general concept of trading range for strength with the exception of attacks that are dependent on one another for max damage is pretty sound I think. So with actions out of the way, let's now step up a bit higher in the application hierarchy and talk about turn order and execution. Combat is managed at three different levels. A combat manager, for lack of a better word here, I just refer to as combatants in my code. Two combatant groups for the player and enemy mechs, and then the mechs themselves inside of whichever group they belong to. The combatant manager is focused on really high level management of the mechs and groups. For instance, when a level starts, the combatant manager loads in the data from the level editor and spawns mechs into the correct combatant groups and locations. It also does a bit of dependency injection so that it can be signaled for various events by combatant groups, 
such as when a turn has been completed or if all mechs in that group are dead. And it also adds a few helper functions to the combatant groups. After that, it largely just waits to be notified of when a turn has ended and signals to the opposite combatant group that it may begin taking its turn. Combatant groups manage the individual mechs belonging to either the enemy or the player team. These groups do things like cycle through the available mechs to make sure everyone has taken an action before marking the group's turn as complete, letting the individual mechs know when it's their turn to take an action, and monitor overall team health so we can let the combatant manager know when a level has been won or lost. The groups don't handle a whole lot of code, but what they do is pretty integral to the operation of the game. So as I mentioned above, I load in mech data from a level editor, so you may be wondering what that editor actually looks like. In short, the levels themselves and the editor are both just made of grid maps that I edit in the editor. There's one grid map for the basic ground and water tiles, though the actual water effect is just a simple partially transparent plane. There's one grid map to define the spawn locations of the mechs, and then there's another grid map for foliage. In retrospect though, I should have just done level design on a simple 2D tile map and then rendered that data into the grid maps as it would have been simpler and faster to work with. Plus, Godot doesn't seem to like having multiple grid maps being edited in the scene as I'd occasionally get an error about certain signals already existing and not able to be connected, and this was usually followed by some general weirdness in the grid maps, like a tile from the ground grid map appearing in the foliage grid map, and I'd have to restart the editor to fix this. Despite being an imperfect solution though, it did still work quite well as I was able to put more levels into the game than I was expecting. And since the levels are composed of grid maps, that also made it easy to load data into Godot's built-in A-Star 2D library to build out pathfinding. Why use A-Star 2D instead of the 3D variant since this is a 3D game? Well, simply put, there's no verticality in this game, so there's no need to have the vertical access as part of the pathfinding process. This is especially useful since not everything is on the same plane anyways. Foliage, for instance, sits on top of the ground, but should still act as an obstacle for pathfinding purposes. Dropping the y-axis from pathfinding makes this automatically get taken into account since we don't have to worry about what height an object is at, just whether or not it should be blocking the way. So now that we've talked levels, let's take another game design break and talk about how the levels were actually designed. This being my first tactics game, I can't say that this is something I'm well attuned to, and there's definitely a lot of room for improvement with this game. So to try to figure this out in a time efficient manner, I tried to fall back on the core concept behind a lot of great game design decisions, and that is giving the player meaningful choices. Tactics games are natural fits for providing the player with options and letting them decide what path to take, especially when you throw in a thinking and reactionary opponent who is working towards an opposing goal. So in LMX, a lot of the time it comes down to which targets do you attack first, which ones do you try to avoid, and how flexible is your strategy. Do you try and funnel enemies through a choke point but risk being slowly beaten down by ranged attacks, or do you split the team and try to take on all the enemies at once but risk being defeated in a one-on-one -on -one encounter? Do you always keep water and lightning mechs together to do maximum damage, or do you split them up and do less optimal damage to maybe try and keep a fire mech alive? I think the level Surrounded, which is coincidentally also the hardest level in the game, is the level that best shows what I was going for with my level design. In this level, you start out with a fire, water, and lightning mech in the middle of the map. Two enemy mechs are nearby, but don't have a direct path to the player. And two enemy mechs are further off, but their path forward is more clear. Do you go ahead and attack the mechs that are nearby? If so, the fire mech risk opening up a more direct path for that enemy to take. Do you move to one side of the map and engage in combat earlier or stay in the middle? Staying in the middle buys you the most time, but it leaves you exposed to range attacks for several turns and will eventually lead to all four mechs surrounding you and doing some serious damage. It's choices like these I wanted to offer. Some levels like Surrounded offer this, while others are just a bit too simple or too time consuming to really effectively pull this off. The difficulty in designing good levels is also impacted by the fact that there's only one type of enemy mech in the game and it always has the same stats. Having weaker and stronger enemies to choose from would have given me a lot more freedom in how I design my levels, since as is I can't vary the number of mechs that a player faces at any one time too much without making the levels too easy or too hard. And since you can always take time to heal, it means that levels with multiple isolated encounters really just become slogfest, as the last level in the game unfortunately demonstrates. So I touched really briefly on AI previously, but I'm going to dive into that a little bit deeper now and explain how that's set up. The AI in LMX is pretty simple, but fairly effective for what it is. The only major flaw with it is that there's no coordination among enemy mechs, which is the main thing I think would help improve it and make it more interesting. Without coordination though, I was able to get by with just an AI node on each mech that can be used by the mechs that need it and ignored by the player's mechs. 
Having an AI node on every mech could also be used to provide suggestions to a player about potentially effective moves. Though that was obviously completely out of scope for the jam, I think it could be a nice option to have in a larger scale project. As for the actual decision making, it really just comes down to this. If an enemy mech is next to a player, punch them. Otherwise, move towards a tile adjacent to the closest player mech. Then perform a melee or ranged attack if within range for either, with a preference given to melee attacks since they are stronger. Lastly, if there's no other viable action to take, just repair. Not much to it, but it works pretty effectively as this game is neither a cakewalk nor brutally unfair. If I had coordination among mechs, it'd be great to have some enemies focus on ranged attacks, others focus on melee, and some focus on flanking the player or otherwise trying to get them to move in a certain direction or to split the group up. So that's kind of the direction I would go if I was going to expand on the AI further. So lastly, let's talk audio, starting with the soundtrack. The song for this jam is pretty simple, with bass and drums driving the song and a few synthesizers layered on top to fill everything out. As I usually do for game jams, I focused on making a short loop that wouldn't just completely drive the player crazy to hear repeating over and over and over. I like to accomplish this by not having any drastic changes in the melody or composition, and also not having any sort of lead instrument mixed too strongly, and oftentimes I'll just exclude any sort of lead instrumentation altogether. That funky interlude or crunchy guitar solo sounds cool the first 5 or even 10 times through, but it ends up making it really obvious when the music is looping, and eventually it just becomes grating on the ears. So the soundtrack to LMX stays at a constant level of energy, and no instruments ever come in or out of the mix. Not the most exciting way to compose, but at least you just kind of start to ignore the music after a while, as opposed to wincing every time the loop starts over. For sound effects, I had a hard time finding anything online I liked, so I decided to just make it all myself. There's a bit of processing on each sound effect to do things like add some saturation and positive harmonics, make some EQ adjustments, maybe add a little bit of reverb and echo, but otherwise the effects consist of this. The flamethrower effect is the tried and true method of just blowing into the microphone when you need a flame or kind of explosive sound effect. The water effect is just a running faucet. The gunshot of the pistol is just a snare drum, which ended up not mixing very well on top of the music, so that was a bit of a misstep. The punching sound effect is an electronic snare and clap combined together to just give a nice smacking sound. The lightning attack is crinkling aluminum foil as the lead up static charge, followed by the sound of me hitting the garage door with my fist. Synthesizers create the sound effects for both repairing and dying. And hitting the ground either upon death or when moving is me hitting my office chair with my fist with a little bit of a kick drum mixed in underneath to make it more rumbly. And I'm not going to say that these are the greatest sound effects in the world, but I think they're fairly solid considering they're pretty humble sources. And so I would highly encourage the viewer to try and make their own sound effects sometime and see what they can get out of it using techniques like this. And if you're not sure how to make something, just give it a Google. I do that all the time. There are entire websites and forums dedicated to the art of Foley and sound effect creation, and so you're sure to find some options that are feasible for you. And that is a pretty in-depth look at how I made LMX in only two weeks time. Overall, I'm pretty happy with how the game turned out, and it's definitely a pretty big milestone for me to tackle 3D and tactics in only two weeks time. There's definitely a lot of room for improvement with this game, but I feel like I have a much clearer idea of what this process and overall system design would need to look like for a future project than when I've started now that I've gone ahead and done it once. And hopefully you have a clearer idea of how to make a game like this yourself. Thanks for watching.